Who would have thought that the answer to gender equality in leadership could be found in the balcony scene of Shakespeare's famed Romeo and Juliet? Tis not thy name that is my enemy. Thou thyself art not a Montague. A Montague, what is a Montague? It is neither arm nor hand nor face nor foot. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. If that which we would call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, then why is a great leader called a man? If we truly want to develop great leaders, we can no longer use gendered discourse to describe leadership. Not only does this perpetuate gender bias against women, but it inhibits the leadership development in men and women. Women deserve to be given the opportunity to lead. Companies and communities do themselves a disservice when they do not give women these opportunities. The leadership pipeline would be better served by being more inclusive rather than restricting access. Women remain underrepresented in leadership of companies and government. Although blatant forms of sexism are no longer openly accepted, subtle forms remain and gender stereotypes prevail. Stereotypes assign behaviors and attributes to members of social groups. This can be problematic where these stereotypes are inaccurate or they work to inhibit members of that group from acting in ways that don't conform with the stereotype. Gender stereotypes against women create negative perceptions about how they lead or if they can lead at all. This also creates negative self-perceptions that erodes leadership identity and eventually the disengagement from the leadership pipeline altogether. Women are judged differently when they lead as opposed to when men exhibit the same qualities. Women who are often exhibiting effective leadership are considered to be acting out of the norm and judged negatively. Now leadership characteristics are often defined as either feminine or masculine. Feminine attributes include being collaborative, cooperative, relationship-oriented, and caring for others. Masculine attributes include being assertive, aggressive, task-oriented, and self-confident. The non-gendered terms for these attributes are communal and agentic, respectively. Now, historically, men dominated leadership positions. And so over time, successful leadership traits have become ascribed to males. And this has evolved to the think manager, think male phenomenon that effectively restricts women's abilities to advance in their careers. Women have been historically absent from leadership. And so over time, the effective leadership skills are considered male behaviors and when women act in these male behaviors, they are criticized for doing the same thing for which men are praised. If you want to change the gender stereotypes, you have to change the underlying social influences. Society is conditioned to deny leadership identity to women. Society is also conditioned to consider men who exhibit communal roles and traits as anti-masculine because those roles and traits belong to women. So if you want to eliminate gender bias, you have to change the social influences that perpetuate it among society. Now, discourse is the way we talk. It's the communication of thoughts by words, speech, and conversation. It's a social construction that influences our behaviors and actions and how we see the world. It's this collection of statements and expressions and terms that describe a particular issue. 
The words and language that we use defines our reality. The, word, the names that we give create context. The workplace is a social construction as well. It reflects the shared meanings that are shown in the discourse and behaviors of the members of the work groups. Leadership discourse heavily reinforces the masculinity of leadership identity. Often, the personification of great leadership is a confident, aggressive, assertive, self-assured man. If we disassociate the image of a great leader from a gender, we set the stage for a more egalitarian approach to what defines a great leader. Now, I read an essay recently that found that Sheryl Sandberg's loudest unwritten advice in her book, Lean In, was that women should adopt more masculine behaviors, such as assertiveness, self-confidence, and risk-taking. The author went on to say that this advice backfired because it suggested that the only way you could be successful was to be an anus. Now, I could not make this immediate connection between being assertive, confident, and taking risks to be negative. The author's conclusion insinuated that a woman who exhibited these traits was negative. The author was a woman. Women face a double bind in leadership. Society expects women to exhibit communal traits, while they are also expected to exhibit agentic traits because agentic traits are required of effective leaders. Yet, when women have these agentic traits and meet those expectations, they are considered unfeminine or as one researcher described it, a biological female acting like a social male. What is that? <laughs> now, the flip side of this reasoning is that femininity cancels out leadership ability. Now, I love the color pink. I had these awesome quilted pink totes and matching laptop bags. And I even got my initials embroidered on them. And I didn't feel my leadership quotient diminish when I carried the bags, nor when I made the purchase. I mean, I felt like quite the effective leader and stylish on top of that. <laughs> and I remember having a conversation with my male outside counsel. And the focus shifted from the quality of the legal defense of the woman opposing counsel to her personal appearance. Apparently, she had an affinity for pink, too. And I remember how he described in condescension her little pink notepad and her little pink bag and her little pink pen and her little pink post-it notes. And I started to kick all of my pink accessories further and further under the table. Listening to him speak negatively about her made me question how he felt about me. I was the only female executive and attorney. And soon after this, I got rid of my pink bags and I went out and bought me a more leadership-like black leather tote. This entire exchange made me question whether my femininity made people question my leadership ability. Is pink the scarlet letter of leadership? Gender discourse gives power to behaviors and actions that fuel perceptions about the color pink, as well as about whether or not women belong in the leadership pipeline and confidence in their leadership abilities. Gender characterizations also impact career decisions. Agentic qualities are often associated with STEM careers. Communal qualities are often associated with certain healthcare and education positions. This can have the effect of discouraging men from pursuing nursing and classroom teaching positions. Even though over the past two decades, the number of women in 
ma once male-dominated environments has increased tremendously, the number of men in female-dominated work environments has remained fairly stagnant. Men often face social backlash for pursuing communal roles. Likewise, women who seek leadership positions in male-dominated environments are at a disadvantage because she is associated with communal roles and the position is associated with agentic qualities. There is an economic consequence to gendered leadership discourse. The business case for leadership for gender neutral leadership discourse is that it encourages effective leadership across the board. When you suppress leadership identity in either men or women, you lower the overall organizational performance. When you suppress leadership identity in women, you diminish the corporate value of human capital assets. It's like buying a high-powered software and only using the word processing capabilities. There is a cost to leaving high-performing female talent on the shelf. Embracing great leadership and embracing a more fluid way of defining great leadership reshapes the dialogue, beliefs, attitudes, values, and discourse around how people can lead. Research has consistently shown that transformational leadership is the most effective leadership style because it inspires loyalty, it stimulates innovation, and engenders organizational commitment. Yet, the hallmark characteristic of this leadership style are so-called feminine leadership attributes. When you embrace the power of a nurturing leader who is cooperative, relationship-oriented, and cares for others, while simultaneously celebrating a woman who is confident, competitive, aggressive, and makes decisions, you open up the leadership environment for both men and women to operate in the full spectrum of leadership attributes without social penalty. Increasingly, great leadership is considered to be when you are able to mentor and coach others rather than be merely authoritarian. Additionally, millennials prefer a leadership environment that is rich in feedback, open communication, cooperation, and opportunities for collaboration. This suggests that a leader who is not competent in communal traits will not be as effective as one who is. Now, the use of agentic and communal sounds a little clinical and maybe even like something you might catch as an airborne disease. But these leadership competencies are best described as being able to fuel achievement and build relationships. So if we shift the discussion away from feminine or masculine to relationship or achievement-based leadership skills, we can begin to break down the barriers that reduce an ambitious woman to a single syllable. We can expand the capacity for leaders, and we can create leadership environments where both men and women can fully embrace all leadership styles without limitation. So let's return to that balcony scene once more. Romeo, oh Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. If thou wilt but be my love, then I'll no longer be a Capulet. I take thee at thy word, call me but leader, and I'll be new baptized, and henceforth, I'll never be a woman leader, a feminine leader, a woman who leads like a man, but I'll be a woman who is a great leader. Thank you.